what development policy is about, to a large extent, is to see how we can avoid situations ever sliding into crisis, how we can help uh, create um, a degree of economic, social, and political stability um, and progress that will allow um, um, a, a stabilization uh, uh, that will allow a, sort of a, a consolidation of um, the structures, societal structures in a broad sense, um, and therefore will allow people uh, to develop, uh, to prosper, to move to a better life in their settings, in their countries, in their societies, in um, their environments, and therefore avoiding uh, many of the sources that may lead uh, to conflict. Water, you mentioned, and you said that might be more something to be dealt with at a global level. Yes and no. Uh, I mean, heck, we have to deal with water in Central Asia or water in North Africa or water in a number of other places. It's also a global problem, but we have to be able to find a way of dealing with it in both ways. Um, so I think that, uh, I mean, what you said is actually a good illustration of why development policy is a necessary complement to foreign policy. It's not subordinated. It's not just an input. It's a complement. We will fail in our foreign policy unless we're successful in our development policy, and probably vice versa. And that brings me to the politicization of development, and we should sort of somehow prevent it. Development is politicized already. You mentioned it yourself. You said that, of course, there will be a degree of conditionality, we should set performance targets, mm. and if countries don't perform, we cut off aid. That's political. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's not about uh, whether they've uh, sort of managed some very technical objective here or there. That might be for some specific program. If they don't actually do what they set out <coughs> to do or said they would do, uh, then we have to put in question whether that program actually works or that project actually works. But at a larger level, uh, when a country seriously misbehaves, we put in question whether we should continue to work with them. We've even institutionalized that in our development instruments. We've got Article 96 in the EDF Convention that says when uh, countries do not behave according to our agreed criteria, uh, including minimum standards of governance, uh, then we suspend aid and talk to them about it and see how we can put them on a path back to resuming aid. So of course development aid is politicized. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of, but we have to make sure that it's still managed <coughs> in a political context that allows us to pursue the fundamental objectives of that assistance. Simon, um, can I yes, just please, respond yes. to that quickly? Yeah. Of course development is political, and that's not the point I wanted to make. The point I wanted to make was the development budgets shouldn't necessarily be opened up to short-termist Foreign, more classic foreign policy interests so that you shouldn't have your development funds pillaged at the expense of short-termism. So I think it's maybe more useful to look at it in that short-termist, long-termist perspective. Those in the development community would argue, including me, that development policy is your best long-term foreign policy bet for security, for migration, all the rest of it. That's development policy, de development spending spent well and targeted well. And to take that to the EU level, I would argue that actually development is what the EU can do best in terms of foreign policy. And the worry is that there's a construct in the external action service, there's a de desire, different member states have different desires about what the high representative should be, what the high representative should represent some want it to be the, the roving foreign minister solving international problems. Other, others see it more clearly as, well, that's never really going to happen. So the fear is that it would be great if the high representative was the high representative in the current context saying, development's what we do best. Let's do more of the same. But there's a fear that the monies are getting shifted over to be possibly used for other things, and we need to act against that. And just a final point on this, what's development, what's foreign policy, and we need to compete with the BRICS and all the rest of it. Well, if we look at what China's doing in Africa, frankly, if we were to really compete with China, we would be offering 
a lot more money to various African countries incentivized in the right way so that, that those countries would be more willing to go with our way of doing things than the current setup, which is China's giving a lot of money away without any conditionalities at all. It's not political. It's buying favor. And we'll see the results of that in 50 years, and we will wish that we had done more good development and put a lot more money into classic development um, in, in countries like that. Uh, you, sorry, on, develop, on conditionality, are you, do you think the Chinese are right not to impose conditions on the money they give? No, I just think we're a bit silly for not offering more with our conditionalities, because perhaps if we had a bigger carrot to dangle, we would be able to incentivize good behavior and sort of beat the Chinese there. Outspending the Chinese is a brave thing yes. to want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm uh, Valerie Segrini from the organization Mercy Corps. Um, it's concerning the politicization of aid um, and uh, development uh, support. I'm thinking more about an example um, like in Afghanistan at the moment at national level, what we see in terms of where most of the support for development is going is where basically the troops are um, to stabilize the regions where the troops are. That causes a lot of problems. NGOs working in the field really think that the geographical balance is not is not appropriate, and this this is not this is shifting from is basically shifting from a, a development aim to to a political a purely political one, and a fight basically. So this is uh, also what we fear um, in what could happen if if um, Europe develop more its foreign policy <coughs> becomes a greater player, and if development is. Um, too much under the uh, political foreign affairs uh, mandate. This is moving money around in Afghanistan you're talking about. Okay? Yes. Just, just before you answer that, then we'll round up on this and move to the second yeah. level of discussion. Mm -hmm. I have one piece of advice for you in your new job, which is that if you want the answer to a problem, look at how the UK does it, because you'll find the answer. And... Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Um, that's a joke, in case we're being broadcast. <laughs> but there are two or three things that are worth just, just, uh, just thinking about, because this discussion has a long history also in the UK. Um, the first is to be really clear about what development aid can and can't do. And mm -hmm. we have an aid act in the UK which specifies that aid must be used for poverty reduction. That is, I suppose, analogous to what's in the Lisbon Treaty. Um, we're also very keen to emphasize the, the DAC criteria for what aid can and can't be spent on, which rules out a lot of the things that the most extreme foreign policy hawks would like to spend aid on. I mean, you can't spend aid on military operations or police forces other than training and that kind of thing. So we have a fairly protected area for aid. But we recognize the importance of joined up thinking across government. And how does the UK do this? It has a whole series of public service agreements, which are headline objectives for the government as a whole. One of those is achieve the MDGs. The second one is uh, stop climate change. A third one is security. There's one on terrorism and so on. And DFID, as the development department, sort of owns the MDG objective and is a party with others uh, to the other objectives. Now, we don't know whether the new government will continue this system of managing government work, but it does provide a very useful framework for saying, if we want to deliver these high-level objectives, what exactly do we have to do in order to reach them, working across government? And when you then carry that through to the work of DFID, um, look at last year's white paper, which, again, may or may not represent policies that will be continued by the new government, but does say some quite strong things. Uh, first of all, it says, uh, I mean, it constructs an argument about development being in our common interest, and it provides an intellectual framework for linking foreign policy and development. It says that more than 50% of all the aid money will be spent in fragile states. Um, at the moment, by the way, more than 50% of EU aid money is spent in middle-income countries. But more than 50% will be spent in fragile states. And a growing share will be spent through the multilateral system. And uh, if we could have a white paper of that kind in an EU context that was clear about what the comparative advantage of development cooperation was, was explicit about the overarching objectives that were going to be followed uh, by the European Union, and was then taking that argument down to the level of how money would be spent and other resources would be used. I think that would provide you with a very strong 
defence as well as a very strong kind of offensive framework for taking the whole discussion forward. But clearly there are some big risks, and we've just heard about one example from Mercy Corps. How do we avoid that? Um, I, but I, I think, I mean, uh, is this political or foreign policy versus development? Is it long-termism versus short-termism, uh, et cetera? We, we can, we, one can try to define it different ways. I'm not sure that putting them in opposition to each other is helpful. Uh, they should be seen as different points um, in a range of activities or on a spectrum, and ultimately we find the right uh, compromises and complementarity between them. You say that uh, money is spent in Afghanistan in the regions where the troops are. Uh, true. Uh, to a large extent. The question is, is the money spent there because the troops are there, or are the troops there in order to allow the money to be spent? Uh, in Somalia, there are no foreign troops. There's hardly any spending. It's too dangerous to go there and do anything. We have a few brave NGOs that still ask for funding and go there, and they regularly have their people picked off. Um, that's a responsibility they take. It's not something that we uh, gladly contribute to, but we could not do it with our staff and tell them, we're going to post you to Somalia. It doesn't work. So the question is, if we want to help Somalia get back onto a track of having something that resembles a functioning government, a functioning society, in which you can pursue development goals, what do we have to do? I don't have a short and easy answer. and I. I don't think anybody else in this room does either. Uh, okay. So, I mean, that's, that's, there are other countries, and that's why I like your idea of looking at this as a spectrum instead, where you have um, reasonably stable structures, not necessarily very uh, sort of solid or good structures, so there's a lot of room for improvement, but it nevertheless gives you a basis where you can work. I could name a range of other African countries or southern or so southeast Asian countries where that is the case and where therefore one can pursue a solid development agenda. And if you look at what the EU does there, and to take your example of embassies versus different offices, we only have EU delegations. Uh, they spend 90% of their time or 95% of their time on development cooperation in pursuit of those objectives. Short-termism, long-termism, uh, two answers to you, Eloise. Firstly, uh, if that's your main worry, um, you should stop worrying right now. Uh, because our legal instruments for cooperation are based on long-termism. Uh, one of the things, <coughs> I had a discussion yesterday in a, in a different context where, somewhat to my surprise, one of the interlocutors said one of our problems, this was um, a, a leading um, international NGO, one of <coughs> our problems working with the EU is that we can only get funding for three to five years so we don't have a long planning horizon. And I said, I mean, get real, boy. Uh, you, you turn to most national agencies and you have a one-year planning horizon because they only do it per budget year. You would never get a five-year planning horizon. Possibly, I don't know what different practice is on that, but I mean, it, in most countries, one, maybe two years. We do most things long-term. Short-termism is what the EU does least well. We're very bad at short-termism and improvisation, which is why we love doing long, multi-annual indicative programs that are then reviewed in consultation, etc. So stop worrying right now about that. All right, we, we have That's about nice. another six or seven minutes, and I just want to make sure we just get any points that come out of the audience on the specifics, and then we'll come back to the panel. Okay. Forgive me for a last round. Yes, please. Jane Backhurst, it is a specific question. Um, sorry. Jane Backhurst, it is a specific question. It's really to hear your views about how this structure is going to be able to make good on commitments that have um, been uh, decided on over the time I was working in Brussels, uh, 10, 15 years, around linking relief, rehabilitation and development. Um, whole of government approach there has uh, been debated, but certainly um, I think the, the consensus amongst the, the humanitarian aid and development community that it needs to follow, needs to be really embedded in international law. I think this is an opportunity, there's a lot talk today about fear, but um, I'm looking at the European External Action Service is finally being able to get this right, that linking relief, rehabilitation and development. Could you comment on that, please? Okay, very good. Any other last points, please? 
Hi, Glenn Tarman from Bond. Um, we've only got a few months left. Um, there are concerns. Our worries are not allayed across the NGO community. Um, Concord, the many NGOs there, Bond here in the UK. It's going to come down to what mechanisms we can put in place uh, to ensure that development is not subsumed by uh, security and foreign policy uh, in the way that we all have different takes on. But it will come down to what mechanisms are there. Concord set out recommendations, and I wonder what the, what the panel feels should be put in place, and perhaps more importantly, what can be put in place in the time that we've got available to us. Thank you. Anybody else? Please. And about the Minister of Justice. Just, just, uh Budget Work, Ministry of Justice. Um, Charles mentioned justice and home fair issues and how that might play out in the year AS. And I'd just be interested in hearing Christian's views on that. Very good. What's your biggest hope or fear? <laughs> Undecided yet. So just the fact that I think really we would like to see those issues, uh, those, that as an, um, an agenda item and something that's taken into consideration. Um, usually it's kind of justice and home affair, rule, um, rule of law issues in particular, that's not seen as so high a priority as perhaps development type issues and I think that's something that we think should be taken into consideration as well. Very good, thank you very much. Please, last question from you or comment. Louise Winstanley from AB Columbia. Um, I just wanted to take up Eloise's point that she made about the conflicts that often happen, which are between often between tra uh, trade and development, and also trade and human rights. And whether you might comment something on that, I'm particularly thinking in terms of the Colombian FTA that's um, going through at the moment, and, and how you actually join up all your thinking about principles of the European Union on human rights and also the kind of impact that that's going to have. As you mentioned, the issue to do with drugs, it's going to have on small farmers, et cetera, uh, especially with the introduction or, or promotion of biofuels and things like that in Colombia. It is interesting, isn't it, how as these questions accumulate, the EAS covers almost everything, and you do this 100-hour problem does come very much to the fore. Uh, let's go start with Eloise and go along the road. We have to finish in five minutes, so just one, yeah. choose one point to make, and we'll give you the luxury of two points. That's a really hard choice. Can I make two really little points? Yep. OK. Um, <laughs> in response to your, I don't have to worry because don't worry, we do long-termism. Well, that's great. And, and it, it happens to be that that long-termism is very well defined. Of course, it's the content of what's in those policies which is important. And uh, we want them to remain very much focused on development. So it's not just about long-term, short-term. It's about who's running the show and we think that should be in the Development Commissioner's hands. In answer to Glenn about what can be done, our positions are not actually that far apart. There is a bit of a silly point in the current draft decision that says that the High Representative and the Development Commissioner are jointly responsible for various levels of programming, and then they jointly submit decisions to the College of Commissioners and then everyone says, but don't worry, you see, the commission decides at the end, so it's a commission decision. We think there's a lot of ambiguity in there, and all levels of programming, implementation, budget decisions should stay with the development commissioner, albeit in very close cooperation with the high representative. That wouldn't take a lot to do. It's totally feasible, and a lot of actors involved, including in the parliament, aren't as opposed to that as, as you may think. So. Okay, thank you. Charles. Um, my point is that I think we need to define our interests. I'm the only person in the room who's dared to use that word today. Interests are important, and uh, some of our aid priorities, some that not all, should reflect our interests. David Miliband uh, last year noticed that the EU, on per capita terms, gave massively more aid to Nicaragua than Pakistan. I think sort of 20 or 50 times or something like that. I forget the figure. Somebody probably knows them. Uh, and he's trying to get that changed, and as a result of his efforts, there's been an e the first ever EU-Pakistan summit and so on. I do, I do think you have to reflect um, your interest in your priorities. And just, just to finish on the point that Simon raised at the beginning about why people who work in foreign policy think geographically, I think it's because geopolitics is about power, and a lot of power, sadly, resides in states. Of course, not all power. Drug gangs are not part of states. Rebel armies are not part of states. Organised crime is not policy. It's a huge amount of power is about states, and states are very geographically defined, which is why foreign policy people 
perhaps regrettably need to spend a lot of their time thinking about geographical issues. Mm, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Mm. Christian. Well, right, let's start with power. Uh, of course, politics, in, in a general sense, even at the national level, is about power uh, and how you use it. Um, some years ago, um, I can't remember exactly who it was, but some American commentator on the EU and its nascent foreign policy uh, tried to sort of, um, um, sort of make a parody of it by saying that uh, EU foreign policy is speaking uh, softly and carrying a big carrot. Um, and I think not only was he right, but we should be proud of it. That is our power. Europe has learned the hard way that carrying big sticks and wielding them is not always a very successful way forward. Sticks may be hard, but they're also brittle and they break. And when they break, a lot of people get hurt. And a lot of people in Europe have got hurt, and that's why we've decided to do things differently. So we like being the purveyors of carrots. To present them, to cajole, sometimes to withhold them. Mm. That's not a bad thing. And I think that it's something that can certainly also be um, so conceptualized in a power paradigm, if that's what we'd like to do. Um, the, the, uh, how, how can we conceptualize it in a different paradigm? You talked of the sort of headline agreements of the British government. We, we, in a sense, we have that at a European level. We have it in boring things like communications and council conclusions. In the area of development, we have the European Development Consensus, which sets out quite clearly and has been signed at the level of prime ministers from all the member states what ought to be done, what ought to be the main guidelines that are pursued, and how coherence should be achieved across different policy areas. On that, and, uh, trade and development, or a number of other areas, and a quick word on, on justice and home affairs as well. Um, finding the right balances is never easy. Um, do we want to promote um, the, the sort of uh, modernization, or whatever we should call it, of agriculture in a number of developing partner countries and allow them to compete more effectively on international markets, including European markets, with their products? Most people would say yes. Uh, does that mean that they should also be able to um, um, compete on the international markets as one of their products, the raw material for biofuels? Then people say, well, hang on a minute, we're not sure because that's not good for smallholder farmers. Uh, right, so shall we say we'll have high protection walls for biofuels? Then other people get angry. We have to find the right balances here. Um, I, I would contend that EU trade policy is a lot better than its reputation. There's a lot more that can be done. Um, but one sort of unsung example, when a few years ago, I was responsible for the Mediterranean and Middle East. Um, when we had a round of negotiation with those partner countries, we offered to each and every one of them, all Mediterranean partners, full free trade in agriculture, total free access to European markets immediately. No quotas, no tariffs, nothing. Uh, in return, a gradual scaling up of their agricultural production as well. They all said no to it because they preferred to protect their own markets. All right, um, we have to find ways of maybe um, looking at how we can find partial solutions. But we're, we're not as defensive or as closed as people like to think. Justice in home affairs. Again, if I may take an example from my previous existence, I think, Charles, you're wrong. This is not something that happens totally separately. Um, one of the banes of my existence as uh, director for the Mediterranean Middle East was to negotiate readmission agreements on migration um, with the partner countries around the Mediterranean. We could combine that with all sorts of programs for uh, uh, social and economic development in disadvantaged regions in the countries in order to improve prospects for people to make their lives there rather than having to up sticks and, and seek their fortune either in um, cities or um, across the water in Europe. Uh, we could do it with all sorts of other complementary approaches. We were constantly undercut by member states 
who either offered immigration quotas and said, if you, if you, if you promise to take back everyone except the 2,000 that we take, then um, that's fine and we'll give you 100 million euros or something uh, on top. But well, it's not very easy then to negotiate a deal with them. Um, but the problem is more one of finding a joined up approach between what's done at the national level and what's done at the EU level rather than across the EU level. There are programs specifically targeting migration issues um, that we do not just vis-a-vis -vis Europe but also migration between countries or regions in the developing world to help them manage these problems because let's be clear while people whinge a lot about immigration or refugee issues in Europe the main migration problems around the world are not in Europe they're in the developing world so there, there are again that's an area where I think uh, we, we, we are doing things, we can do them more. Hopefully with a new treaty, uh, we can also create a much greater degree of coherence with uh, what's done at national level. Very, very, very last point, the, the linking relief um, uh, and, and development. Um, by bringing together in the European Action Service, uh, External Action Service, uh, the, the sort of the consolidated knowledge, the consolidated desks that deal with all issues, political, economic, development, um, uh, and the sort of crisis management, um, uh, conflict prevention issues. We hope that we will have a stronger basis, analytical and strategic and programmatic, uh, to develop a good approach. Add to that the fact that the humanitarian side, ECHO, has been substantially strengthened in the new commission with the merger of the civil protection units that existed elsewhere in the commission and that spent a lot of their time coordinating efforts undertaken by member states um, with the, the work already done by ECHO. Uh, a strengthened ECHO working hand in hand with a consolidated uh, European Action Service, we believe and with the support, if you like, the intellectual or policy support from DG Development on the horizontal issues, we believe gives a better basis for, and will get better chances for achieving uh, a real effective LRID policy. Very good. <coughs> Thank you. Three things to finish. First, um, if you haven't seen the open letter that the three think tank directors, apart from ODI, and I wrote to President Barroso and Cathy Ashton and Andres Pibags about three weeks ago, uh, we said, actually, don't, we think you've done a pretty good job in getting the architecture in place, but the problem now is to make sure that you've got the resources to deliver. You need a strong person in the EAS who's going to be responsible for development, and you need the capacity of the development commissioner uh, to deliver, and one or two other things as well. So do, do pick that up. Do come to our next meetings. Uh, we have one on the 17th of June, which is the day that the Council meets to discuss the uh, spring package, and the title is The EU Spring Package, The Radical Agenda the EU Needs? Question mark. We have one on EU coordination and division of labour the following week, 24th of June, and one on the 1st of July about development financing, building up to the next financial perspectives. This is 20% of our aid programme, uh, and it's all our trade, and it's a lot of other things that really matters to us, so we can't turn our backs on Europe we want to make it work. I think the discussion we've had today has demonstrated how important it is to think strategically as well as about the detail. Um, I'm very grateful to all the speakers, but particularly to you, Christian, for coming over from Brussels and to say that you need to know you have friends in the UK who will support you in your new job and we wish you all success. But please, thank you, uh, thank you all for coming. Join me in thanking the speakers. Thank